everyone. Uh, I'm Pooja, and we're excited to welcome you to our first Friday's Lunch and Learn. Today we have a very exciting speaker, Dr. David Kitor, and he is a UCI ICS alumni and a very, very smart person. So I will let him speak about his background since he has so much experience. And before I hand it over, I just wanted to give some updates about what's coming up. We uh, just wanted to update you guys and let you know that we won the UCI Alumni Association's Engagement Award. So that was a cool award. Next Friday, uh, next uh, Lunch and Learn, which is the first Friday of November, will be November 6th. And we have a very special uh, panel type setup. We will have Dean Marios, the Dean of ICS. And the topic will be how to connect with ICS and UCI. So we will look at it across the board with how to connect as an alumni, how to connect with professors and teachers and the school. So stay tuned um, and we will send you all that information. We're also looking to do a Halloween dress up contest for the best tech related costume. And we will post information about that. So, you know, start getting some ideas together because it'll be kind of fun to see it. And other em events that we have coming up will be a Jackbox style game night, as well as a scavenger hunt. So we have a lot of cool events coming up in the next few months. And uh, please uh, join our email list or please tell your friends and uh, other alumni to join the um, email list and uh, LinkedIn and social media, which will be the best way to get information. So without further ado, let me pass it on to Dr. David. Thank you. Um, sharing my slides here. Everybody can see the slide? Yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can see okay. it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me here today to talk to you. Um, so, as you heard, um, I graduated um, with my PhD in. Uh, from ICS, the uh, ECI. I had kind of a non-traditional path to academia, um, so I didn't go straight out of um, undergrad to graduate school. Um, so I graduated from UC Irvine with a pre-med degree um, first, and then took a job at the university, uh, the Neuroimaging Center, doing statistics and so uh, on um, neuroimaging data sets and really got into research and got interested. And so then my master's degree uh, was in software engineering from Cal State Long Beach. I did that in high school while I worked full time. And then a uh, bunch of years later, uh, I had the opportunity to work on my PhD at UC Irvine, also um, as a part-time student um, while I worked full time uh, in the Department of Psychiatry in the School of Medicine. So a um, little different background than most, but uh, it's been really exciting and interesting the whole way through. And uh, so if you have the chops to do uh, school while you're working uh, in research, I, I recommend it. it, it was it was, it was was cool. Uh, so my uh, PhD advisors were Drs. Alex Eiler and Park Smith from um, computer science department there. So you may know them. So today, um, you know, I thought a little bit about what, uh, you know, what I should talk about in, in the, time frame uh, we had available. And I thought um, it's probably kind of interesting to just at a high level uh, give you some examples of how different classes of uh, models from machine learning and statistics are, um, are used in the field of neuroimaging. Um, high level view uh, with a bunch of uh, you know, quick examples um, instead of going into details on any particular um, in any particular uh, research project. So if you're looking for details, you probably won't get them, but you'll get this broad overview of what we're doing. Um, some of it's my work, some of it's colleagues' work, and some of it's uh, you know, uh, colleagues that I'm, I'm, I'm not directly working with. So just a little primer on uh, neuroimaging for those of you who aren't really familiar. With, um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. I think you can, but um, Functional, so there's a couple different uh, modalities that I'll be talking about today and really that we generally work with in, neuro, in the field of research neuroimaging. 
they're the functional uh, modalities and, and uh, predominantly structural modalities. Functional modalities, you know, generally consist of positron emission tomography and uh, that's PET and SPECT, um, which is sort of a close cousin of, of PET. Um, those modalities, you essentially um, develop a, a radioactive um, ligand, which uh, binds to some uh, biochemical process in the body that you're interested in measuring. And, uh, and then you uh, use the scanner to essentially detect gamma rays that are emitted from those radioactive ligands, uh, count up the number of gamma ray emissions detected, and through a bunch of complicated mathematics, you can reconstruct what was in the center of the field of view or inside the scanner from these count data. Um, functional magnetic resonance imaging is uh, another uh, functional technique where you use an MRI scanner, a completely different technology based on magnetics and um, um, spins of electrons. Uh, but essentially in functional MRI, you're measuring uh, blood oxygenation. <laughs> Um, and uh, you can look at changes in the blood oxygen level, which is a surrogate for neuronal activity. So you take uh, images over time in fMRI with a high temporal resolution, but uh, a poor spatial resolution. Structural MRI is uh, used for looking at soft tissue. We'll see some examples of that. And uh, CT, computer tomography, is mostly for looking at bone. It's kind of like high resolution x-ray. So uh, the reason we kind of use machine learning and neuroimaging is because um, you know, the models from machine learning are good uh, in uh, working with uh, data that has noise, a noisy samples. Um, it's not always so good in working with the sample sizes that we commonly have in neuroimaging. These are expensive data sets to collect, so we generally don't have enough data. We're underpowered for lots of the uh, you know, new machine learning algorithms um, that are, you know, designed to work on web scale data. But um, you'll see in the series of slides that there are some uh, interesting examples where we can bring these models to bear on the data sets. Um, also, the things I work on specifically are applied machine learning and applied statistics. What I want are models that will tell me something about the uh, biology that I can then uh, bring back to the clinicians and, and uh, hopefully bring to the clinics and improve uh, patient care. So that's a slightly different. The black spot models, I'm not really that interested in because uh, they may work great, but uh, it doesn't tell us a whole lot about the biology. And so the little chart on the right there shows you how um, you know, machine learning has been used in neuroimaging. It's a bit old, but you can see there's an explosive growth of machine learning used in this field, um, and more so every day. I included this cartography of machine learning because I thought it was an interesting and kind of cool slide from Psychic Learn uh, Toolbox. If you are a Python programmer, then you know, uh, probably know about this toolbox. Really nice kind of machine learning toolbox, easy to use, but um, kind of fun. Uh, you start at the start uh, node and you go to the first node after that and it says, if you have, basically it says, if you have less than 50 samples, go collect more data. Well, a lot of the uh, examples or most of the examples I give you today are using less than 50 samples, but you can still uh, use many of these algorithms on uh, small sample sizes. You just have to uh, take some care in applying them. Essentially, we'll look at some classification models and clustering models today, uh, some dimensionality reduction models. And um, we do a little bit of regression, but um, the other things that are missing from here are Bayesian techniques, learning high dimensional probability distributions, which we'll see some examples of. So in terms of classification and prediction, so uh, generally the phases of uh, building predictive models in um, biomedical sciences, you start with some a priori hypotheses about the biology. That's really important um, in this field if you're going to um, apply any of your machine learning techniques to um, clinical data and want the physicians to uh, first understand the results and be able to relate it back to biology. So you take some a priori hypotheses, you do some, um, you know, Bayesian or frequentist statistics. Um, you explore the data and you come up with um, the kinds of predictive algorithms that you want to build. Then you have this cross-validation phase where you'll take your data set and you'll split it into training and testing. You'll do that uh, a bunch of times. Um, this is sort of, you know, commonly referred to as cross-validation. You may do some feature selection where you do some data reduction or remove some of the features to improve your, uh, sorry, classification accuracy. Uh, many of the good 
classification techniques nowadays use ensemble-based classifiers where you build a whole bunch of different uh, classification classifiers using different models and average the results across all those, they do pretty well. Um, and then once you have your sort of uh, framework set up, then you uh, go into the generalization phase where you apply it, your train classifiers on the prior data set to independent data and evaluate how well they did. So an example of this uh, is some work I've uh, recently done in Down syndrome. Actually, this paper, the link below is for a preprint, but the paper was just accepted yesterday in the Alzheimer's and Dementia Journal, which is a pretty uh, prestigious journal in this field. Essentially, what we wanted to do here is we collected a data set um, of uh, people with Down syndrome, 19 of them, and we took a PET scan at baseline. This was a for beta pure PET scan, which measures amyloid plaques in the brain, which is kind of a uh, one of the markers that we can track. Um, increases in amyloid plaques in the brain is generally associated with worsening of uh, dementia um, and Alzheimer's disease. And so we took 19 of these participants, we gave them a baseline PET scan, we then followed them out for four years. Five of them transitioned to clinical dementia in that four year time span, uh, on average 1.9 years after the baseline PET scan. We then built uh, logistic regression classifiers. We'll see the results on the next page using uh, these training data and tested it on an independent data set of people with Down syndrome who we collected, a, again, a baseline PET scan. And within uh, 1.3 years, a subset of them transitioned to dementia. So we asked the classifier, how good are you uh, using univariate um, univariate features of the brain. So I say univariate, I mean a single region of the brain. So each row here in this table is a single region of the brain. So prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate, inferior parietal. So using the amyloid measures in each of these brain regions independently, how good were we, was the classifier at predicting who would transition to dementia in the future in that independent uh, data set? And we found that we could do quite well even with this small sample size in predicting who is going to transition in the future. The idea here being these separate regions of the brain, um, we know something about them and what uh, cognitive processes they're involved in. Um, and so from these data, we uh, know that the amyloid plaques are um, uh, accumulating in those regions and that tells us something about disease progression. Moving on from clustering, um, or that sort of, uh, sorry, classification into clustering. Um, we look at dimensionality reduction in clustering. So in these brain scans, so the middle, the middle slide here, the brightly colored brain, this is an example of a PET scan. Red areas are areas where we've um, accumulated more gamma rays or more radioactive emissions from those regions that in, in this case, this is a glucose scan. So those are neurons that are using more glucose. They're in red and yellow uh, areas that use uh, have no glucose usage or, you know, blues um, in this image. And normally what we'll do is you'll take an atlas, that's the image on the top left, you'll take an atlas which uh, defines spatially uh, different brain regions, uh, typically created on uh, structural MRI scans. You can then take these regions and you, you know, plop them down on the PET scan and you sample the voxels underneath, in, uh, contained within each region average them and that's the sort of thing that we used for the pr pr prior slides on Down syndrome where we looked at the classification accuracy. Well, the problem with that is these regions are big and if on the top right slide, if you looked at the, um, the cross section of just one of these regions, on the bottom right, you'll see a profile of the counts um, in those regions and you see kind of two peaks and a valley in between. And so uh, the idea here is that these, using these large anatomically defined regions may not capture the complexity of the uh, signals that we're seeing underneath them. Uh, another problem is these brain scans are 3D volumes, so they may have about 10 million um, volume elements or voxels in them. Uh, so that's a lot of data. So one, one way of reducing the uh, uh, complexity of the data is to average things for anatomical regions. Now you have you know, 200 anatomical regions as opposed to 10 million voxels. But as we can see from this slide, you may be missing some information. And so we did, uh, we thought about what do these uh, sort of profiles look like and what they look like are mixtures of um, Gaussian functions. Um, and so if you were to do a, a, create a mixture model of Gaussian functions or distributions 
You may have three uh, independent Gaussian distributions that together form a surface. And if you were to look like and uh, look at the bottom uh, right there, if you were to look at the 3D surface formed by these Gaussian distributions, it would look like the sort of like the profile that we saw in the previous slide on the PET scan. So we built uh, uh, a model that uh, essentially learns 3D uh, Gaussian uh, distributions because we have count data here. We can use the distributional form as opposed to the functional form. Um, another way of sort of reducing the complexity of the data, um, these Gaussian distributions then would be used for further statistical analysis or uh, functional connectivity or looking at pairwise correlations between regions identified by these Gaussian distributions. Um, the hope being that you uh, capture some of these, uh, all of these sort of peaks of activity um, and uh, as opposed to using the um, uh, anatomical regions alone. Uh, another way uh, that we use clustering in uh, neuroimaging is uh, in the uh, space of fMRI. So this again is functional magnetic resonance imaging. The way this normally works is we take a uh, picture of the brain every two seconds for some time span. In this example, it's 100, uh, 100 brain volumes. Uh, each two second, it takes two seconds to acquire each brain volume. The spatial resolution isn't as good as the PET scans on the previous slide, but we have high temporal resolution here, so we can take a scan every two seconds. So then one thing one could do is uh, apply a brain atlas to these uh, fMRI um, scans and sample certain regions of the brain. Now we have 100 time points here. So we build matrices for each participant of uh, the, um, the scan over time. That's the y-axis and these little uh, pink charts on the bottom left. Uh, uh, and then the regions are sort of the x-axis there. So um, we have the uh, value of the time series signal at each of the TRs, at each of the volumes we collected over all the regions. And so then what we can do is we know from other work in um, structural connectivity modeling, uh, certain uh, networks consist of um, various regions of the brain. So we have a visual network that consists of regions involved in visual processing. We have a, a, a somatosensory network. Uh, we have a frontal parietal network, executive function. We have a default mode network, which is like the resting state network. So we can take each of these networks and we can say, we can ask the question uh, for each subject, for each time period when we captured a brain scan, what, uh, which of these networks is most like the areas that have high uh, blood oxygenation, which means that they're being used more. And we can then use a Markov chain to determine the transition probabilities over time across our entire data set of how long and when they transition from one brain state to the next. This tells us, depending on which uh, brain states they're transitioning to and from, uh, given the um, stimulus that was uh, shown to them during the collection of the brain scans, this tells us about how the brain is processing those stimuli and which uh, areas of the brain are being recruited. So this is a popular technique nowadays. Neural networks, everybody loves neural networks. They're very popular in the field of neural in, neuroimaging. Uh, a little less popular when you start to uh, want to understand why a neural network is giving you a specific result and relate that back to biology. They're more like black boxes and a little bit of black magic involved in creating them, but, um, but they're being used with some interesting results. So the idea with the neural network, right, we're trying to uh, build a course model of how the brain works. In the brain, you have a bunch of neurons. They are connected to other neurons in this dense network and they pass information um, across that network and compare it to uh, sort of templates of um, what a person has learned before. So your parents teach you what a cat looks like. Of course, you haven't seen every cat that you could possibly see, but your brain can uh, take a low level representation of the cat that your eyes are currently you know, fixated on and match the template of activity to something it remembers and say, this looks most like a cat and not like a cup. So in neural networks, we design these to be sort of similar. Um, usually in neural networks, you have the input images, you have a convolution layer where you break the input images up into smaller uh, patches. Uh, you convolve it with some filters 
You then take most of those patches and you have a pooling layer. Typically, uh, you have a normalization layer and then you have a highly connected network. In this case, the output of this network was detecting which scans had infarct, hemorrhage, or tumor, uh, and they can tend to do pretty well. Another application of neural networks for this sort of uh, activity is to uh, be able to reconstruct a, or construct a synthetic CT scan, which is um, panel C and G here, from uh, an MRI scan input. So these are two separate modalities. But what we're going to do, or what they did, was use this UNet, which is a, learning, a neural network model where you have sort of an encoding uh, portion and a decoding portion. The encoding portion takes the input, which is the MRI, and the CT scan pair, and uh, trains the neural network to output um, a synthetic CT scan. Then you can give it MRIs uh, from people who didn't get a CT scan and generate the synthetic CT scan. The UNet part, the decoding part, uh, takes the synthetic scan that it learned or that it produced from the MRI and tries to determine which the synthetic scan or the true CT scan are, 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 the, uh, are the real ones. And from that information, it feeds it back to the input layer and improves the way it can and, uh, create these synthetic CT images. Another application of neural networks in this space, uh, we want to segment the brain. This is the ground truth column. We want to segment the brain from, uh, into gray matter, white matter, and CSF, three classes of uh, brain tissues. And uh, we want to do that using just a T1 uh, weighted acquisition or just a T2 weighted acquisition, a little different structural scan um, in MRI. The T2 uh, really uh, highlights like uh, white matter and cerebral spinal fluid, whereas the T1 is mostly a gray matter uh, sequence. And so uh, they built two neural networks separately, one for uh, using the T1 weighted scan to segment the brain and one that uses the T2 scan to segment the brain. These did okay, but have uh, misclassified voxels throughout um, the CSF or the ventricles generally in some white matter. When they then uh, densely connected the two neural networks, one for the T1s and one for the T2s, we do a much better job at creating this segmented brain. And it's done much quicker once you have your neural networks trained. Another uh, example that you probably have heard about in the news over the last few years is brain decoding. Uh, this is kind of an exciting um, area of research, although it's mostly a, a pattern recognizer as opposed to anything that uh, really teaches us about the biology. Idea being that you uh, put someone in an MRI scanner, you show them a bunch of images in this example, uh, you record their brain when they're seeing certain images, you then use that information to build a neural network that is able to detect from the brain activity which image that they were seeing. Then they put people, uh, different people in the scanner, had them go to sleep. They measured their sleep uh, state with EEG and they'd wake them up just before they went into REM sleep. You dream, it, it used to be thought that you only dream during REM sleep and now uh, they're finding more and more evidence that you're dreaming through these uh, other stages of sleep and not so much in REM sleep. So what they did was they measured the stage of sleep. When the individual got into a stage of sleep that was non-REM, they would wake them up and they would ask them to report what they were uh, they remember from their dream state just prior to waking up. Then they took their brain scan uh, activity just prior to waking up. They fed it through their neural networks and they tried to match up what uh, the neural network told uh, them, of which picture the neural network told them that they were seeing in their or thinking about in their brain when they were asleep, and compared that to what their self-report was, and they found that they did better than chance in uh, detecting these uh, image categories, which is, is pretty cool. So another class of models are high dimensional probability distributions. Uh, you might think of Bayesian statistics when you think about these sorts of things. I'll show you a couple examples uh, or one example quickly of using sort of high dimension, dimensional probability distributions. In this case, it's in neuroimaging, but it's an engineering problem. It's how to tune PET scanners. So at UCI, we have these, this thing called the HRT PET scanner. It's the highest resolution brain-only PET scanner in the world. There's 16 of them in the world. We have one of them. Uh, we've had it since 2005 or so. And it's still the highest spatial resolution PET scanner in the world. The, the idea here is it's a, it's a scintillation camera. So it's like using a Geiger counter to detect gamma rays. 
but this PET scanner has 121,000 Geiger counters in it. Uh, and so a lot of these detectors and it, it can accumulate counts, uh, gamma rays uh, using these detectors. So each detector panel in this uh, machine has 64 of these scintillation detectors in it and they're very small and they're packed into this lattice and uh, there is no uh, boundary between each of these crystals. And so um, they kind of look like this image here um, and there's just no hard boundaries between them. So when you go to tune this PET scanner, one of the things you have to do in tuning is you have to identify where each crystal is in this lattice. And as you can see from the uh, colored pictures here at the bottom, the, uh, as you look across each of these little detector, um, uh, detector panels, the uh, position of these crystals within the detector panels is not consistent. Um, these colors come from putting a radioactive source in the center of the scanner and looking at where the counts uh, accumulate with respect to their spatial location in the detector panel. Uh, areas of red are more counts and areas of blue are fewer counts. And from this, Siemens, in this case, it's a Siemens scanner, Siemens provides a utility to find this, the locations of each of these detectors. It makes a lot of mistakes, probably about 5% of the time it makes mistakes. So that's about 6,000 6, detectors. And an engineer like myself would have to go in and fix that and it takes about you know, a little over an hour to do that. So we built a comprehensive system here um, using um, many tools for machine learning to uh, improve our ability to tune these detector panels. And we uh, got a 39% uh, uh, decrease in mean squared error. So meaning we did a better job than the tool from Siemens. Uh, so the first step was to create a prior, a prior over the configuration and location of these uh, detectors within uh, each, within the detectors using um, prior system tunings. So we've had this machine since 2005. So we went back, we went through the prior system tunings. We used uh, a, a procedure called iterative proportional fitting, where we took that prior distribution over where these detectors, the detector centers are, and combine that with a, uh, a structural profile of uh, the dependency between each of the detectors uh, so that we relax the long range dependencies. So um, that factor, or that structure looked kind of like an, an iron cross kind of shape. So that with the prior um, system tunings, we came up with this prior distribution over detector centers. The next problem we have is the noise along the edges of these detector panels. This is from uh, light generated by the crystals in the neighboring detector. If it, if it was, um, if a gamma ray struck the neighboring detector, the light was generated in those crystals you see the light in the neighboring panel because there's no firm boundary between them. So we call that crosstalk and it's all the stuff along the edges of the boundary. We used a Markov random field, uh, which a lot of people use for segmentation to segment out this noise. We did it with a couple different um, potentials. Uh, one was a, a height potential that said, hey, if you have high counts, we see high counts on the ridge of these panels. So there was a, a count related uh, potential and there was a spatial uh, location potential as we move into the center of the panel, that's where the detectors are. We know the detectors aren't on the edges of the panels generally. So we have this spatial location uh, potential and a height uh, potential. We use that to segment out all this noise. Once we do that, we built a factor graph, which is like taking a very high dimensional probability distribution and factorizing it into a simpler distribution so that we can learn um, the the model parameters essentially of this uh, probability distribution. Um, this factorized graph looks like the following. Um, you basically generate a series of interesting points in the image that may be detector centers. We don't know. Um, those are the nodes at the bottom. Each of those interesting points could represent a detector. That's the middle row of nodes. And from those detector centers, from all these interest points, we can create a weighted combination of the location of those interest points that serve as exemplars for each detector. From that, we get a spatial center and a variance around that spatial center that is constrained by our prior distribution, which is at the top, uh, the one we learned from proportional, uh, iterative proportional fitting. This is like, uh, you know, like affinity propagation, if you're uh, familiar with that. There's an affinity for the uh, detectors to select an interest point. And there's um, 
a responsibility that the interest points take in representing a detector. Um, basically, uh, the result of running our algorithm is shown in this little video. The red dots are uh, the locations it found for the detectors. Um, it doesn't do perfect, but uh, perfectly well, but it does much better and doesn't make um, some systematic mistakes that we find in the Siemens uh, methodology. And there's about 936 of these blocks in the machine. So, um, you know, and with lots of different configurations. So it's pretty remarkable that it, it worked well like that. Um, so uh, the, not, the last series of slides are on uh, general uh, generative models of uh, applied to functional brain imaging. These are, uh, in this case, uh, Bayesian models. The idea here is that uh, in fMRI, um, sometimes we scan the same uh, participant over multiple um, days, or we scan uh, the same participant over multiple sites. We'd like to have a, uh, a model that can detect where the activity is um, in the brain across multiple runs, either within a subject or across multiple sites, and has some uh, constraints on uh, how it can model the activation. So what we did was we turned to mixture models. Uh, these are Dirichlet uh, mixture models. Uh, the idea here being is um, we can model the activation with Gaussians again. Um, they can have uh, the, a mean location, which is a spatial location. They can have a variance. And we want to let the variance be able to change um, across scans or across sites, but we want the spatial locations to be uh, fairly consistent. Um, one way we can do that is by put, uh, adding a random effects prior to uh, this model where uh, each participant or each scan is allowed to vary the parameters of the Gaussian, so the mean and the variance, but constrained by its own prior distribution so that they can't vary too far. And uh, it also constrains the model such that the same number of Gaussians is applied to each of the scans. So in the top row here, we have eight runs from the same subject in the scanner. You can see the white areas are areas of high uh, oxygenation. Um, and so we want to uh, model the activity or the activation in each of these scans. If you look at the unconstrained uh, finite mixture model here, you can see that depending on the scan, uh, a different number of Gaussian distributions are, um, are used to model that activity. So very difficult to make sense of this or see consistency uh, or differences across each of the runs. If you just use a uh, hierarchical Dirichlet process without a uh, random effects prior, then you get a, a, a very restrictive model where there's essentially one big Gaussian and that's not very interesting. But with the uh, random effects component, you now have the same numbers of Gaussian components across each of the runs, but they're uh, free to uh, move with respect to their mean and change with respect to their covariance matrix, uh, but still are uh, a bit restricted by the prior distributions and sharing of information across uh, the models for each of the time points. So, um, you know, pretty interesting use of Bayesian statistics in neuroimaging. And that ends my presentation. I thank you for the, for the time. Wow. So thank you so, so much, Dr. Keeter. Um, uh, so uh, for, for everyone, um, feel free to um, uh, put any questions that you might have in the chat or even unmute yourself um, and, and ask questions. So we're, we're kind of transitioning into our uh, sort of open Q&A session. So feel free to ask away. Um, uh, I'll go ahead and start. I've took a couple notes here. Um, and let me see. Uh, so, for, so first off, I mean, uh, I feel like my, my brain, speaking of brains, I, th I feel like my brain has expanded. And uh, it's uh, <laughs> definitely a lot of, a lot of good data there. Um, Interesting. So, like, I think you made a comment about sort of black box, like neural network being kind of a black box. And I was trying to catch, and I guess maybe the different models kind of compare, you know, like a compare and contrast. And if you could talk a little bit about sort of your preference for different models. I know, like, you, you kind of mentioned that you weren't a big fan of like a black box, like the black box method. If you could kind of speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I, so... And I have, I have nothing against neural networks. I've used them uh, in the past, and they, they work great. Uh, I think with a neural network, you can model really any complex function. Um, 
and we've done a lot. I mean, so they were, they were, you know, really cool in the uh, 90s, I say, and then maybe in the early 2000s, like nobody was interested in them anymore because they had trouble learning these complex multi-layer neural networks and then some research and increases in computer speed and so forth um, allowed us to, to better learn multi-layer neural networks and that's where it took off again and they're doing quite well. I guess my problem with them is, I mean, you build something that you give an input and you design it with multiple layers and you tweak it, maybe add a layer here, maybe add more connections, uh, maybe add some more convolution layers, uh, maybe change the different filter you're using and, and you do that until you get it working well. Then it works well and it's sort of this black box like thing. Uh, you give it an input, you get an output. And if you ask the question, what about the biology resulted, or what did it use most mm. about the biology that resulted in that correct output? You have a really hard time. There, there are a couple methods for looking into this, uh, ways of looking at this. Um, you can decrease uh, the number of edges, you can take out certain units, and you can uh, kind of see how your, uh, your accuracy changes. And that will tell you something, but uh, it's really difficult to go back and say these four things about the biology res mm. you know, really resulted in these correct output. Um, so, so using simpler models is sometimes better in medical science uh, when we want to learn about the biology um, than using sort of these really complex things uh, that you, yeah, you just can't really understand what it's, it's a very complex interaction between your features that result in a correct output. So. Got it, got it, that, that makes sense because, um, and, and it's interesting because I've, I've sort of heard different um, uh, just comments about neural networks where, you know, w when you're building it out, it, it's almost like kind of haphazard how you, how you create the structure, right? It's like, yep. we just add more. <laughs> and add, yeah. add, add a couple, you know, like different permutations of how you structure it just, you know, and maybe it works better. And th that's wh where your sample sets sort of work out for you, right? It's just, you kind of just don't know. Uh, and then, but I could, I could definitely see where, if, okay, so let's say you do get a result and you do try to fi figure out, okay, what about the features are triggering this result? And you just, it's, it's a bit of uh, opaque uh, and, and trying to figure that out. So I can so definitely see that. Yeah, I've been working a little bit recently and I'm super interested in this. If we can de design neural networks in such a way that helps with this. So um, mm. maybe depending on what your input data is, it may be possible. So, so you could think of it like uh, take, um, you know, whatever, hundreds uh, regions of the brain as your input, the, the average value for the data for those hundred regions of the brain, but only connect regions that are, you know, together, the input layers together in a, uh, you know, in, a, in the next layer that are structurally connected in the brain, wired together in the brain, or share some information in the actual brain. Uh, and so kind of from this sort of architecture, one might be able to then sort of understand what interactions between brain regions that we know are structurally connected in the brain resulted in a good performance of the neural network. And that will tell us something about brain circuitry, I think. Um, but it's hand wavy sounds, at this point. So, sounds, sounds like a good uh, uh, thesis someone could work on for their, uh, for their, grad, for their uh, uh, doctorate. Um, wh one question around, um, I guess just pure like computational power um what, what sort of constraints have you run into has it sort of progressed over time I, I, as a as a pseudo lay person in, in machine learning like you know like i've uh i hear i hear that you know gpus have have really con uh, contributed to sort of um the speed of generating uh models and things like that or just at least training and, and actually actual evaluation has that has that affected you in your work over the years? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, so certainly uh, the ability to, you know, use, so first of all, in uh, many of the programming languages, um, like Python being one of them, they have some really great libraries for machine learning now that uh, you can use that use your GPUs. Um, and so that makes it, you know, way easier than back in the day when we were using, you know, C and had to, you know, 
write low level code to use the graphics cards directly mm. as opposed to now calling high level functions. So that's one thing that has made this a lot better. Uh, certainly faster GPUs, a lot more GPUs on the graphics cards, a lot, lot more memory, that's another thing. The uh, Amazon um, EC2 platform or any of these cloud-based platforms make it really nice because you can uh, you know, spin up machines with a certain configuration, run your or train your models on those machines, spin them down, then you're done paying for them. And you don't, you know, in the past we had to go out and, you know, you spend $30,000 or something for a computer and, you know, a year later it's sort of slow, right? Right, and right. Now what do you do? You just spent 30 grand, you can't keep doing this. <laughs> um, so the, the cloud uh, computational services really helped. And also at UCI, the high performance computing uh, system here is, is cool. And I've been using that for now five or seven years, almost exclusively for these sorts of things. Um, it's available to everybody. They handle all the administration aspects. You can ask for a certain number of GPUs or a certain number of CPUs or a certain memory in each of your submitted jobs. And you know, I, even some of the brain segmentation work we do takes about you know, 14, 16 hours per scan to, to, to run. But I can, you know, I can re rerun all of those for like 80 participants in literally one night if I can get the nodes on the HPC. I just submit all 80 jobs. And gotcha. if I'm lucky, I come back the next day and they're all done. If not, it's the day after that. And I paid zero for <laughs> using that HPC. Um, so that's really nice too. Um, yeah, so I think all of that combined makes a huge difference, especially with being even able to learn these multi-layer complex neural networks. It, it, it seems like it, it gives you more options to experiment on, on different models and just be able to quickly test, evaluate, test, evaluate, and, and that cycle tends to, I, I would imagine, would speed up sort of pr progress. Yeah, and then also the, the um, you know, high dimensional probability distributions, like the last example there with fMRI, those, the, the priors um, and the distributional forms, they're non-conjugate, which means, you know, you, you need to run some sampling technique to draw samples from this complex probability distribution to figure out the parameters. That, you know, Markov chain Monte Carlo takes a long time. You know, you mm. run multiple of these, you know, streams and you run them for a long time and it's just, it takes a long time to do that sort of thing. So yeah, gotcha. using any computational improvements you mm -hmm, can. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, let's see, any, look in the chat, no questions in chat. Um, just wanted to pause for a little bit, see if any other folks had questions. If you wanted to take yourself off mute, feel free. If no questions, I, I, I'll, I can go ahead and ask a couple more. Um, so one thing that I do find um, interesting as far as um, trying to figure out what inputs you should use and sort of, you know, so I guess there's, um, you know, uh, I don't know, like, I guess for, for, the, for your domain, there's standard, you know, your standard inputs, but also I'd be kind of curious to know what your process is like if you've had to go and find new ways to generate inputs and you know whether it's 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 the the modeling that sort of drives that or or maybe it's the availability of new machinery or some other innovation that says okay now you can now you have more data available to you i'd be just kind of curious to understand how that how that dynamic works yeah so i mean we've been so I, I work in a couple different domains. One of them is, you know, applying these machine learning models and that's to medical data as you've heard, but another one is neuroinformatics, uh, data sharing, describing data in a way for publicly available data sets such that you could go out and find more data if you need it. And that's a super interesting line of research in and of itself. We use uh, semantic web, so linked data, graph-based models for describing information, uh, super cool talk as well, I think. Uh, but uh, so one aspect is, uh, okay, take a data set, figure out what features you want, you think you want to use. So those features will, uh, you'll have to compute those features somehow, whether it's go out and find a brain atlas, apply a brain atlas, or 
uh, do some kind of dimensionality reduction or whatnot. So there's that one, there, one aspect of it. Figure out what features you think you should use and modify those features depending on how your you know, model does. Mm -hmm. uh, then another aspect is, yeah, sure, certainly go out and collect more data. Um, typically, that's not uh, possible because typically, you know, you wait, you sort of wait till your end of your study and you use all the data and you try to come up with whatever, you know, address your hypotheses. But now uh, it's getting better. It's still not great. You could go out to a bunch of publicly available data sets that are out there. Neuroimaging data is available. Um, there are lots of publicly available data more each year and search across these data resources and find a data sets that are appropriate for your use. Then you would go off to each of the data set providers. Some of them are publicly available. You just download them. Other ones you have to get IRB approval and go, you know, get, get a login to get it. But you can get more data that way. Um, and then the last um, thing we typically do is okay, well, we've done, we've got our neuroimaging data, we've figured out our features, we've used all our data, we've gone and looked and there's no more data sets around. Now, what happens if we bring in other types of data? So mm. uh, I'm doing a study right now where I showed you the Down syndrome classifier just based on amyloid brain imaging data. So now I'm adding in data from uh, blood samples uh, that measure the same amyloid, uh, you know, a marker of amyloid in the blood also bringing, bringing in CSF, so cerebral spinal fluid samples that measure this amyloid marker in the CSF. And now let's combine those other types of data with the neuroimaging data and create a, we call, we're calling it a composite risk score. So what other types of data that we collect you know, in humans can we use, bring together, create some complex composite risk score function that uses the best features from each of the individual data types? and creates a basically a probability of how you are progressing toward the possibility of developing dementia or mm -hmm. schizophrenia or, well, you don't really all of a sudden develop schizophrenia, but uh, how about depression um, sure. or, you know, that sort of thing. So, so that, that actually segues pretty well into David's question in chat. So his question is, is how do you determine the features uh, for those models? Do you tend to draw more on experience, intuition, exhaustive research, et cetera? Yeah, so um, how many data do we have here? Yeah, yeah. a lot. It's a pretty common. Rolling deep. Yeah. In, my, uh, in my, uh, uh, one of my projects, there's Dave Kennedy and David Keeter. So DK is our initials. So I'm Keeter.Dave and he's Kennedy.Dave. Anyway, uh, so features. Uh, so it kind of depends on what the research project is. Um, so in the case, so sometimes it's ex totally exploratory, where we just think about, um, you know, based on uh, prior experience, what kinds of features can we extract from this kind of data set? And then we'll extract all those features and we'll just like, put everything in the kitchen sink through these mm -hmm. models and do feature selection to have the model tell us which features were most important for its predictive accuracy. And from there, we prune down the number of features that we end up training our final model with. In other cases, we'll go off and do background literature, uh, re you know, review what's known about the specific problem we're interested in and uh, use features from those, uh, you know, published literature and mm -hmm. say, you know, uh, you know, researchers X said that these five regions of the brain were the ones that were, you know, instrumental in determining who's going to, you know, have dementia in that example. And we'll go out and use those five regions of the brain and just test it in our data set and give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, the last way you can, uh, we tend to do that is with um, uh, decompositions of some kind, take the data, compute these uh, covariance matrices and then do singular value decomposition or PCA and uh, then select a number of principal components, usually the first, you know, however many features you want, say you want 20 features, so you select the first 20 principal components um, from the PCA uh, decomposition, then you reproject each of the individual cases into those 20 PCA components and now you have sort of your features, these 20 
sort of principal components. Um, so that's like a data driven feature selection. Gotcha. That, that, and that's interesting just from a, you know, like kind of, do you go from, it's almost like, do you, do you go try to design something or do you go and just try to put everything out there and just see what the data presents to you? Um, yeah. I, you, you almost kind of have to do both, right? Um, yeah. Just to, to kind of cover both bases. Um, yeah, it's usually it's usually like data driven, and then the prior is you know either prior research or what the mm. physicians think or something like that. And you kind of and I've seen people take you know statements from physicians, write them down about their the, their data set that they're interested in, and then convert that to a prior distribution of some kind, and then use that prior distribution over the sort of things that the clinicians think are important in a model that's data driven. So that's pretty interesting too. Um, Sarah has a question um, in chat. As an undergraduate student, fairly new to machine and deep learning practices, what steps can I take to further my knowledge in machine learning and overall experience with such medical research? Um, so MIT has some great online courses uh, that are free. Um, on machine learning, uh, the different types of models. Uh, you can find them on YouTube. I think you could just, you know, maybe search MIT and, and machine learning and you'll see like a whole bunch of those kind of webinars. I think they're a really great resource. Um, they may not be, they're really not specific to medical research. Um, that one's a little harder. I, when I was gonna kind of put in this, presentation together, I went and asked all my colleagues, I'm like, you, you know, you guys have done, you know, machine learning and neuroimaging presentations before, can you just send me your slides? And the slides they sent me, like, I looked through all the slides and I was like, this is, yeah, I don't, you know, don't want to use any of these. <laughs> it, was, it was really kind of hard to find uh, something like this. And, and even, it, you know, you could, you could turn this into an hour talk, no problem, you know, get down into some details, but uh, it was kind of hard to find that sort of thing. So, you know, um, I think if you if you search Google Scholar for machine learning and medical imaging, you will find um, a couple papers that are uh, interesting, um, kind of broad overviews of different classes of models and how they're used. And I think that's a pretty good resource as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some uh, and in any of the uh, Python type training set tutorials, machine learning and Python, those descriptive pages are really nice because they'll show you, you know, yeah, obviously how to code it up in Python, but they'll talk through it at a level, I think that's, you know, less technical. Like, you know, when I wanted to, when I was learning machine learning, uh, you know, early in my graduate career, I mean, I came from pre-med. I mean, I had some math background, but I couldn't even read the books to start with. <laughs> you know, I'd open up the books and coming from biology, I'm like, there's no words in these books, it's all math. Um, and so the learning is steep learning curve is pretty hard. So anything you can find that takes the machine learning models and kind of removes a lot of the math to start with, I think is super useful. For sure. I, I've, 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 um, so I was, in, uh, I just got my bachelor's in, in ICS and, and I, I actually did a project in, in AI and mostly it was around, um, like Bayesian, um, Bayesian networks. So, you know, didn't get too crazy into, like all the like matrix math that's needed for like neural networks and all that stuff. And so when I, I've, I've kind of done the, the Coursera just kind of pick, you know, pick it up and, and I'm like, Oh man, got to bring back all the, all the calculus and all the uh, matrix math that uh, yeah. I try to just scoot by in undergrad. Yeah. yeah. It was, Very it was, cool. Um, Let's see. So we've got just a couple minutes here, um, and and thank you for for spending time with us. It's it's been um, definitely. Uh, I mean, for me, just um, personally, uh, an area that I've I've um, followed, but not followed as closely as I'd like to. Um, I so this was this was good to kind of see different different a different application. I don't work in in medical, so it's kind of cool to see uh, the cross uh, cross pollination. Um, one question that I did have just as far as how long these, whether it's a study or whether it's like a project to kind of understand, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
whether it's um, you know your your kind of the end goal is to to get to um, publishing a, a paper, but about what's the like what's that time frame like um, from just kind of start to finish? I'm just curious. Um. So let's see. Uh, it kind of depends on the project. I, I, I would mm -hmm. think like for me, I think a year is probably something. That's what I, oh, I tell all the students when they come in and everybody wants like a first author paper kind of thing. And I say, okay, well, you know, just plan on a year. Um, gotcha. You know, so we, you know, in certain studies like our Down syndrome study, we collect a data set every 16 months. So this is like a longitudinal study. So every 16 months I'm analyzing data from the prior 16 months and I'm gonna, you know, write a paper on that. Um, and so, you, you know, you know, every 16 months you're, you're working on data analysis, you're working on papers. In other studies, you know, if it's you're collecting one giant data set, it might take you two to three years to collect that data set. And so you're stuck waiting to the end to analyze the data. But I think like the, you know, the time frame from when you start to work with processing the data to when you actually have a paper ready to submit, I think it's probably a year is a good, um, good estimate. And, gotcha. um, and we all, you know, by the way, we have plenty, I have plenty of projects going on. So anybody who's interested in doing some research, um, certainly contact me. I'm, I've got some interesting. Very nice. And, and I have some new stuff I want to do that I don't have anybody to do. So I got to do it myself. <laughs> well, if there are any folks, yeah, if, if anyone here in, in, um, in uh, the, as far as attendees go, um, uh, what I guess what's the best way to contact you if um, if if anyone does have any questions or any um, would 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 like to um, uh, take on a project? Telepathy, it's fine. Just think about it. And <laughs> You're um, scanning everyone. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so yeah, just email me, I guess, or you know, okay. Peter at uci.edu, or um, you can find me on Slack. You can. Uh, GitHub, I'm on GitHub all the time. If you guys use that, I don't know. Uh, I'm all over. So open, open a ticket in your GitHub project. Yeah, right. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Clone it and create like 15 issues, and all of a sudden, I'll I'll know who you are. That, that, that'll get on your radar for sure. <laughs> well, well, very. Oh cool. yeah, so Twitter handle. My Twitter handle is at Brain Junkie. There. Nice. Nice. I, although I don't. Very, very oh yeah, we found it. Yeah, brain junkie. Very cool. Well, thank you so much um, for for spending time with us um, for for the for the attendees. Um, I think Pooja put in a couple links to get on our emailer uh, emailing list and whatnot. Um, uh, so yeah. you know we're trying to make this uh, a, a once a once a month thing. But thank you so much. Have a great weekend, everyone. And again, Dr. Keeter, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to join these now. And I didn't really, I don't know, I didn't realize that they were happening until Lily was telling me about it. And then I kind of, anyway. Very like cool. Continue to cover this. It's interesting. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Bye, Bye now.